we started looking through the first chapter verse by verse and we came to verse 6. I'd like us to look at verse 6 today. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 6. It reads, In all this you greatly rejoice, though for now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. I want to tell you guys a story. It's a true story. Story of a husband and wife. They were devout Christians. Committed, born again, walking with the Lord, serving the Lord, and God was blessing them immensely. The husband had a very successful business. Everything was going great. God had blessed them with five kids. The, the wife was at home and taking care of the kids and their education and everything else. And uh, they were also part of the uh, evan evangelism of the time period they were living in. They were involved with the likes of D.L. Moody, what today you, would, you might know him or people like him as um, Billy Graham of his day. They were very active, good, hardworking, decent people, and God was truly blessing them. But one day, as though someone turned the switch on, as though one thing started or the other one ended, a very clear line has been drawn. Something happened when everything started going wrong. First thing that happened to this couple was they lost their youngest child, their only son. He was about five years old. They lost him to an illness. He died. A year after that, business became so bad and there was a fire too. This man, this family, this husband and wife, lost everything they had. All their life savings, all their investment, everything they had was gone. Reeling from these things happening back to back, husband and wife decided, they said, you know what? Let's take a vacation. Let's go, let's go to London where our preacher friend, our evangelist friend is going to do a series of meetings. Let's attend those meetings and it will be good for the kids too. It will be breaking out of this doom and gloom and bad environment. So they decide to go. Last minute, the husband gets a news that he has to stay a couple days more. He doesn't want to ruin it for the kids, so he sends them ahead. As they're traveling, tragedy strikes again. They were on a ship to cross the ocean. Another ship hits their ship, and this ship that they were on sinks in 12 minutes. A day later, the husband gets news from his wife. Two words, survived alone. <clears throat> the four kids that was with the wife drowned in that shipwreck. The details, I won't go into too much, but this mother on the deck of that ship that they were crossing over with hang on until the last second, until these kids couldn't hang on anymore. And she had to just let them go. By a miracle, somehow, she opens her eyes in a rescue ship. Kids are all dead. So, sends a message to the husband. Husband jumps to the first ship that's crossing over. And the captain of the, the, the boat, the ship that, he, that was crossing over, calls him over. He says, look, I've been looking at the maps and the coordinates. 
And this, where we are right now in these waters, is the spot ship sank. And in that spot, this man takes a piece of paper and starts writing the word, it is well with my soul. That's the hymn you just heard. He wrote this hymn under those circumstances. He lost everything he had, all his children, everything you and I would consider everything we live for. As a husband and wife, they lost everything they had. But I don't know if you remember the lines that reads, we just sang it. Even though all these troubles, like sea billows, these waves after waves, that's the picture he's trying to create. Wave after wave of trouble comes, even though these troubles come. You have taught me to say, he said, it is well with my soul. Today's verse relates exactly to this situation. I have a question. Have you found yourself in a situation where, like sea billows, you've been hit one after another? One thing and another thing and another problem and another problem and another problem. It just, you seem like it's never ending. Did you ever find yourself in a place like that? I would have to say all of you probably have. This verse refers to just that. Let's read it again. Verse 6 says, In all this you greatly rejoice, Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. James, in the book of James, Apostle James, um, not the Apostle James, but the book of James says in the first chapter, Consider it pure joy, brethren, when you find yourself in all kinds of different troubles. How is that possible? How is what Peter's saying is possible? How was it possible to this songwriter? He wasn't a songwriter. He was a real estate investor. But God led him to write these. And we are still singing it today. But I wanted you to know the circumstances in which he wrote this song. How is it possible for us, for them, to rejoice in these circumstances. Why is God in the Bible telling us to rejoice when everything is going wrong? It is so difficult. I know it is for me. But he's telling us what to rejoice in. Verse 6 began with this. In all these you greatly rejoice. When it says all these... It's referring to what the previous five verses was speaking of. I'm just going to tell you what they were. Peter is saying that these people that are going through persecution are rejoicing in the mercy of God, as we read in verse 2. These people are rejoicing in an inheritance that can never perish or spoil or fade. These people are rejoicing in a new birth into a living hope. Do you see the source of joy so far? Source of the joy these people have is God's mercy is giving them joy. New birth into a living hope is giving them joy. Their inheritance, what's waiting in heaven, is giving them joy. The fact that this inheritance is being kept for them by God is giving them joy. And the fact that they are being kept by God through faith for the inheritance, which what we spoke about last week, is giving them joy. And, and this morning as I was thinking and praying about this verse, I discovered something for the first time. I, I did some research into... into um, the word rejoice and the way it was used in the New Testament. You know what I realized? I saw that anytime the word joy or rejoice 
is used in the New Testament, it always pertains to spiritual. It always pertains to the coming life. It always pertains to what God has promised. It never pertains to today, here, and now. And hence, our problem and our inability to be joyful in the midst of the problems. Because we are constantly looking at our own circumstances here and now. We are so immersed in them that what God has promised, what we know is waiting for us, is not making us happy. If we had to be honest with ourselves, we would have to say, most of us are here. Do you agree or no? Do you agree that because of the current circumstances, because of the conditions in which we find ourselves, our peace and our joy is gone. We are not able to rejoice in the fact that God has a glorious future for us, but not necessarily here. Somehow, it doesn't make us as happy as the following scenario. I think most of us, including me, I'm not pointing fingers, most of us would feel so much happier if God was to send an angel very clearly without a shadow of any doubt and say, you know what, you're going to be very successful, you're going to have a perfect marriage, you're going to have very healthy relationships, you're going to have very healthy children, your business is going to be wonderful, you're going to have a beautiful house, a beautiful car, and you're going to have great social environment, and you're going to be very effective, and this and that. If he wants to promise that to us, we will be very happy. But the Bible is not promising anything. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying, the Bible is saying, you're always going to suffer. There's always going to be problems. No, that's not the case at all. But there is some of that as well in life. When you go through those times, especially like sea billows. Like, can you picture what he's trying to say, sea billows? Most of you are familiar with the ocean, right? When you stand by the, uh, by the beach, what do you see? One wave after another. It's non-stop, right? It comes, comes again, comes again, again, and again, and again. Sometimes our troubles feel that way. It comes again and again. Sometimes it's bigger and bigger and bigger. It's non-stop. Sometimes you feel like saying, Lord, I can't take this anymore. This is too much. If it's not physical, if it's not spiritual, if it's not financial, if it's not relationship, if it's psychological, whatever it is, it just keeps coming. It could be your loved ones, it could be your husband, wife, children, parents, business. It just keeps coming. What do you do when it keeps coming? God says, rejoice. You say, it's not possible. God says, rejoice. You say, I can't. God says, rejoice. You say, look around me, God. What's there to rejoice about? God says, rejoice. I have eternity for you. This is only a little bit. This is only 70, 80, 100 years in light of eternity. What are you going to feel like when you're 2 million years old and all this is behind you? What's going to be more important then? It's tough to grasp, I know. We can't. We only know our past lives, however many years it is. But God says rejoice. If it's one after another and another, 
God says rejoice. And we know one thing about God if we don't know anything. He will not ask us to do anything that He hasn't enabled us to do. Yes? God will not ask anything from you that you cannot do. So, why is our difficulty? How is it that James says, rejoice in all kinds of tribulations? How is it that Peter says, for a little while, don't forget, it's not forever. If you look at your life, most of the troubles have not lasted forever. Well, I'm not, you guys, you guys don't have too much in the past to look back at. It might feel like forever, but I guarantee it'll stop. Okay. But those of you that are over 15 know that nothing is permanently imprisoning you. Nothing lasts forever. But there is an eternity that will last forever. So when it comes and keeps coming and keeps coming and keeps coming, how can you rejoice in this life? Our problem is we keep looking at the here and now rather than there. Now, if you have a problem with looking over there, and if you're saying that that's unrealistic, that's not biblical. If you don't believe the promise of God, you can't claim to be a Christian. If you believe the promise of God, then there are certain claims you can make. Here and now will always disappoint you. That's why I believe God's word makes sure that we are not misled, that the word joy and rejoice is never presented for immediate circumstances, for the world, and for here and now. Rejoice and joy is always presented in the future tense of the heaven and what God promised. We will never truly be joyful with what we have right now. And in very different ways, you lived it in your life. Think about the time when you wanted to start driving or buy a car. When you did, you were kind of disappointed after a little while. And then you wanted to buy a better car. You worked hard, you saved, you got the car that you thought was going to make you happy. It did for three weeks. Then it started getting old again. Some of you were looking forward to being with a certain person. Hopefully that's still beautiful. <laughs> I'm not completing that sentence. Some of, some of us were looking for a house, right? If I could get this kind of a house, it would be great. You got that kind of a house. Guess what? It's not what it, it promised. Because you, no matter what, the true joy that causes rejoicing is not physical. It's not here and now. It's always in God's promise for the future in heaven. So when we are going through one after another, one after another, and some of you, I know some of your lives and some of you know exactly what I'm talking about it's non-stop when you find yourself in that spot rejoice in your living hope rejoice in God's promises rejoice in your salvation and if you find yourself that you are not able to say to God Lord help me I am not able to rejoice in my salvation. He already knows. But he wants you to be peaceful. He wants you to live with an expectation of joy and hope. Not this doom and gloom. What, what's, what did the Apostle Paul say to Timothy? He said, God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but of power. What's the second word? Love and self-discipline, self-control. 
God gave you power. He doesn't want you to be sad. He doesn't want you to be upset. He doesn't want you to be discouraged. He doesn't want you to live disappointed. But you will be all those things if your eyes are on here and now. But if your focus is in that day, in God's promise, Word of God says, you will rejoice. Just like these guys who are being persecuted were. We all have our homework. Amen? Amen. God bless you.